Let's turn together to the book of Galatians tonight. Galatians chapter 6. Verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. And then our words for tonight, bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Let's pray and ask God's help as we look into his word. Our Father, the words that we have sung and the sentiments of those words remind us that we live in a cursed world, a world in which there are many pains and many disappointments, a world, living God, in which we need you to draw near to us. And Father, as we come in this hour to have your word opened, we are in great need to have your spirit attend to the teaching of the word, that Father, we, your people, may, in obedience to this truth, fulfill the law of our Savior. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want you to use your imagination with me tonight. And what I want you to imagine is that you are a part of a fellowship or a church in which many of the members at this time in this church are weighed down with a variety of troubles. Imagine being a part of a church in which some of the members have recently lost loved ones to death. And at the best that they know, those loved ones were not in a state of grace when they died. Imagine being a part of a church where there are members battling chronic illness and physical disease that makes it very difficult to simply sit for an hour in church. Simply to sit in a chair for an hour is almost physically unbearable. Imagine being at a church where there are some of the men in financial need, and yet they have lost their jobs. Imagine being in a church where there are brethren who have recently spent times looking over the bed of a loved one in a hospital as that loved one battles to stay alive. Imagine being a part of a church where there are members who face dark thoughts in their hearts and in their minds that overwhelm them to the point where they no longer want to live. Imagine being part of a church where there are members who have faced and are facing the lingering effects of divorce, members who have faced the dissolution of long-standing friendships, being a part of a church where there are members wondering how they're going to make it as they go deeper and deeper into unwanted and unplanned debt. Imagine being a part of a church where there are members who struggle in their marriages, members who battle sins from the past, either that they have committed or that have been committed against them. Imagine being a part of a church where there are parents who grieve every day over a son or daughter who lives in the far country. Imagine what it's like to lose your son or your daughter to death. Imagine being a part of a church where women who longed to become pregnant lose the little one in miscarriage. In this church that I'm talking about, there are issues that are faced by the newest members and by the oldest members. There are burdens that weigh down the elders and the deacons, and all of the members. In this church, there are members who are battling sin of some kind that has in recent days gained the upper hand, and it has causing them right now to question whether or not they're in a state of grace. There are some in this church that I'm talking about, as we use our imagination, where the presence of the living God is not sweet, and near, but confoundingly distant. Imagine being a part of a church like that. 
You are part of a church like that. That's our church. It's not just our church. That's probably, perhaps with varying details, everybody of believers all over the world. If I were to come into this church as a stranger, and we had some folks who visited today, it was their very first time coming here, and I would imagine if I were to say to them, tell me what were your impressions of the people of the church? Now, I hope that they would say, well, I think they were very friendly. Many of them came up and they introduced themselves to us and engaged us in spiritual conversation. I was really impressed with what I saw. And if I were a stranger here and I experienced that, I might think as I looked out, and what I generally see here on Lord's Day by Lord's Day, what I see when I'm teaching and preaching the Word of God, are a lot of happy faces. I watch after the teaching and preaching of the Word, and I see warm embraces. I see cheerful banter. I hear laughter. And I would perhaps not imagine that the texts that I have read bear one another's burdens and in this manner fulfill the law of Christ as a church that would be very relevant to a church like our own. It could seem strange that such a command, uh, or, or, or it could be, uh, rather, it could be that somebody say, a command like that is the kind of command that I will tuck away for a time when the church is undergoing difficulty. If I were to have only a casual acquaintance with my brothers and sisters, I might not ever imagine the darkness that creeps over some at night as they struggle to get needed sleep. What if we could wear glasses that aided us to see spiritually? And we could look upon the backs or the shoulders of every one here, people that we know and that we love, and we do not see them at that time with no burden on their shoulders, nothing weighing their back, but we actually see what they're dealing with in their hearts and in their minds over and over again. If we could really see one another, we would know that not everyone's step is light, Not every home is filled with warmth, not every soul content, not every need for friendship and love met, not every one well tended. That's a fact. And such knowledge produces a responsibility. And it is both that knowledge and that responsibility that I want us to consider from the text tonight. As we begin looking at Galatians 6.2, I want to begin by dealing with the underlying reality or the assumed underlying condition, however you'd want to say it. And then secondly, we're going to consider together the necessary duty and then finally the glorious truth which is fulfilled. But let's begin by considering the underlying reality that is assumed. Some years ago, when I was in England with um, some of you were there with uh, with me, um, some Thenemans were there, and Aaron and Olivia were there, and Larry and Trenda were there, uh, among others. Uh, we went to a place called Bunhill Fields. Now, Bunhill Fields is a place you really have to visit if you ever get to London. Uh, Bunhill Fields is a church historian's dream come true. Uh, well, I say maybe that's hard to say because Bunhill Fields is a cemetery. But Bunhill Fields is a cemetery for nonconformists. Now, somebody goes, what? All right, nonconformists are those who are not part of the Church of England. And so if you want to know where the great Puritan John Owen is buried, he's buried in Bunhill Fields. If you want to see the tomb of Isaac Watts, it's in Bunhill Fields. If you're of a literary bent, you want to see where Daniel Defoe is, it's in Bunhill Fields. And on and on I could go with great people from church history. But in my mind, the the tomb that stands out above all others, and that really is kind of the centerpiece of the cemetery, is the burial place of John Bunyan, the author of Pilgrim's Progress. Now, that uh, burial place has an image of Mr. Bunyan in repose. 
So it's like what if you could see into his coffin when he would die, and there he is, or there his body is, uh, carved or molded on top of that uh, grave marker. And on either side of the body, there is a picture that's chiseled in the side, uh, and the pictures are from Pilgrim's Progress. On the one side is the picture of Pilgrim with his staff and his heavy burden upon his back. And then if you walk around to the other side, it's the portrait of Christian standing at the cross, looking at his Savior uh, it, by faith, and his burden has been removed. It's rolling away and going into the tomb where he sees it no more. He sees his burden no more. And everybody that reads that, their heart sings and we say, Hallelujah. Both portraits are accurate depictions. Sinners are burdened with their sin. And before we come at, well, whether they all feel it or not, they all have a heavy weight on them. Not everybody feels it. Before we come to the cross and behold the Son of God crucified for our sins and look upon Him with the eye of faith, there is that terrible burden of sin that weighs us down and that announces to us the wrath of God. But when we look at Christ, the heaviness of our original sin and our condemnation is gone. And so, rightly, Christian sees the burden fall from his shoulders where it enters that tomb and is not seen again. And if you remember, Christian is at that moment full of joy. And the remainder of the book follows him on his pilgrimage. And though the burden of his sin is gone, the weightiness of what follows in his Christian life is clearly articulated by Bunyan. The whole of his life from the time of his conversion is not simply up, jumping up and down with glee until he dies and then skips over the river into the celestial city. The book follows him as he goes to places like Vanity Fair where he loses his friend Faithful. The time where he is brutalized in the castle of giant despair. His sad time where he spends having walked along Bypath Meadow. The vivid and painful battle with Apollyon. And I could go on and on. So I want to be careful in what I say. When I talk here, what the underlying assumption I'm getting is that all of us have burdens. When you became a Christian, we all say, we lost our burden. We use the language of Pilgrim's Prior, we lost our burden. Rolled away. It was there by faith, I beheld my, that by sight, right? And, and I, I had it all roll away. When we come to Christ, we enter a life of peace. But simply because the fearful burden of sin's debt is gone and canceled, it does not mean that believers bear no heaviness in life. The command in our text is to bear one another's burdens. And if we are to bear the burdens of others, and that is a command, and it's a very important command as we will see, it assumes that there are burdens to bear. Now this text doesn't say clean one another's jets. Uh, you know, vacuum one another's Helicopters. Stock one another's, you know, rocket ships. Uh, I don't have one. All right, you know, so how can I fulfill that? But if I do say carry one another's burden, nobody goes and goes, oh, people at that church don't have any burdens. Well, if you don't know that, you don't know your brothers and sisters. If you think that nobody in this church has burdens, I don't know how to say it, then we're not paying attention. In fact, the text assumes that not only do believers bear burdens, but that every single believer has burdens. Bear one another's burdens. Well, who's bur everyone's? Because everyone has them. Well, some of those burdens are temporary, some are more chronic, and some of them will last the whole of life. Bless God, they will not last forever. Be careful when you use that language. I'm going to be dealing with this forever. No, you're not. You'll be in heaven forever. 
You're going to be perfected forever. You're going to lose all your burdens forever. But it may be all your life. Some of these burdens are heavier by nature than others, and some of them will be heavier for some Christians than for others. The heavier the burden and the weaker the saint, the greater the need for God's people to shoulder that burden with them. Every Christian, on some level, has burdens. And as I said just a moment ago, if you don't believe that other believers have burdens, or other people in this church have burdens, you're not paying attention. Is anybody going to want to stand up tonight and say, Pastor, I don't have any burdens? Maybe you're going to say, I shouldn't. Given how easy my life is, I ought not to. But is there anybody that's going to say that there is nothing at all that to any degree troubles them at this hour? Well, again, maybe we need to know ourselves better. Maybe there are things in our lives that we're ignoring that we refuse to acknowledge. But the text assumes that every Christian has burdens. The word means heaviness or weight or trouble. It's the word that we talked about a, uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's used in Acts 15 to describe the injunctions laid upon the, uh, the Gentiles where they said, we want to delay no other burden than these things. That, that's the word that's used. Things that may weigh them down. Things that may cause them a degree of trouble. The word is used in a very interesting way in 2 Corinthians 4.17 for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That's the word weight there. There is a weight of glory that is far greater than any light affliction here. In our context, it is synonymous with other biblical terms like cares or anxieties. It's a recognition, again, that there are troubles that come upon the children of God. There are matters relating to living a real life in a real world. A world that is cursed. A world that is full of thorns and thistles. A world that is full of sighings and tears and death and sickness and frustration. Life doesn't always go as we plan, Right? Yeah. And grace does not shield us from the trouble or the pain of those troubles. At times, I want to say, why should I feel anything other than blessing in my life? In light of my sins, and in light of what my sins deserve, in light of what grace has given to me. Now, I ought not to complain. But the fact that I'm not going to complain doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean that it doesn't burden you. You see the difference between that? And I'm not saying that we ought to all go about in the name of authenticity and honesty complaining all the time. That's not what we... In fact, we're not ever to do that. But that doesn't mean that we cannot convey to others that I'm struggling. And the fact that I am forgiven and that I am adopted and that I have a hope of eternal life certainly cast a joyous light upon my troubles, but it doesn't mean that I won't have any. And it doesn't mean that I ought to feel embarrassed or ashamed or sub-Christian or sulk in silence or hide behind a religious wall or perhaps even a proud wall of silence in light of the burdens that I bear. We may think to ourselves, if I am burdened, surely I must do nothing other than pray about it in secret. I must never expect another to know of my burden, or share my burden, or help me carry my burden. Should I? Isn't really the height of spirituality, among others, is that everybody looks at us as though we are rock steady? And we have no troubles, no burdens that we bear, no concern, not me. Well, let me help you. Because I'm here for you. And nothing's not about, let's not talk about me and what I have. You have no duties, you have no responsibilities in regard to me. I'll 
You see, that would be to admit weakness, and that might reflect badly, we think, upon my view of God's care for me. Have you ever felt that way? I can't tell anybody. I can't open up to anybody. I, I, who am I going to tell? Who am I going to speak to? Because I don't want them to think that this is all of my life, or that I'm not thankful, or that I'm not joyful. We sometimes... We use this language. This is this is real contemporary language to talk about churches, where we're, talking, we're about, being, about, about being real and about being authentic and about being transparent. Well, that's how we ought to be. The reality is that we live in a cursed world with sinful people. Some of those sinful people are us. Some of those sinful people are redeemed sinful people. Some of them are non-believers. Some of them do not intend to hurt you. There are others, however, that are your enemies who do want to hurt you. And all the while, I live in a world in which there is a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And all the while, I have a heart that is not always what it ought to be. And I have a mind that is not always as mindful of the promises of God as it ought to be. And in this world I make choices, and others make choices, and those choices at times haunt me or trouble me. And there are times when simply the providence of God, what He is clearly, sovereignly bringing into my life, is a weight upon my soul. And if you're like me, you want to take it sweetly. You don't want to chafe under it. You do not, and you refuse to be angry against God, bitter against God, complaining against God. You will not raise your voice or your fist to God. You know and you bow before the reality that He's loving and wise and that He has purposes for what He does. But that doesn't mean it doesn't weigh you down. Now, does that make sense? I hope that that's not contradictory. Imagine these burdens. I talked about some of them in the introduction. There are burdens. Some of them relate to our thought life. Oppressive and depressing thoughts about the past, the present, the near future, the far future. Financial burdens, relational burdens, physical burdens, spiritual burdens. The Bible tells us that many are the afflictions of the righteous. The psalmist says in Psalm 71 and verse 20, You have shown me great and severe troubles. Jesus said to his disciples in John 16, 33, While you are in the world, you will have tribulation. Paul and Barnabas encouraged the brethren, and this really did encourage them and the infant church by telling them, you need to be ready for what's coming down. Because you're going to enter the kingdom along the pathway of a multitude of tribulation. Job says, at one point, he uses this language, God has worn me out. Paul speaks of some of the tensions which exist as he describes both the trials and the blessings of his life. You ever feel this way? 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side. Let me just read his troubles for a moment. Uh, so I'm going to break up the text. Paul, tell me about your life. We are hard-pressed on every side. We are perplexed. We are persecuted. We are struck down. That sounds like a pretty miserable life, doesn't it? Let me, tell you, let me tell you another part about his life. We are, we're not crushed. We're not in despair. We're not forsaken. We're not destroyed. Now, what's true? Both are true. But you say to Paul, Paul, listen, here you have, I look at you and I see a man who's not crushed, who's not in despair, who's not forsaken, who's not destroyed. He said, yeah, that's right. So why don't you pray for you? Uh, listen, uh, I'm hard-pressed on every side. I'm crushed. 
Uh, I'm perplexed. Uh, I'm persecuted. I'm struck down. Oh, well, maybe you need your brothers to pray for you or come alongside you. The point of all this is clear. Coming to faith in Christ does not shield you from trouble. As glorious as the grace of God is and the hope of the future is, and it is glorious. As wonderful as the promises of the present are, which sweeten our trials, weights are weights, and we will feel them. So that's the under, that is the assumed reality that this text has. You have troubles. I have troubles. You have weights. You have burdens. I have weights. I have burdens. That's the reality of the Christian life. Let's consider, secondly, in light of that, the necessary duty that is declared. Let me say just a quick word about verse 5 of our text, because it's one of those things you look at and say, all right, bear one another's burdens. And then verse 5 said, for each shall bear his own load. Well, what do we do? We bear our own, or do we have somebody else bear our burden with us? I believe part of what is being said in verse 5 uh, is that there are trials that are unique to us that we will bear. And in regard to ourselves, it's one thing. The text we're looking at tonight is not telling us so much what to do with our burden, so I'm, I'm going to give some encouragements in regard to what we're to do. Really what we're doing here in our text is that we are looking out for others. So that our life is more thoughtful of the burdens of others than our own. Let me give a, a general illustration. Now we really can use your imagination. I'm not tricking you now with my imagination. Imagine that every Lord's Day, each of us arrives carrying a backpack. And we have our names stitched on the back of it. So it's Jim's backpack, you know, Daryl's backpack, Ryan's backpack. We have, we have backpacks with our names on them. Some of these backpacks are large and they are heavy and some of them are smaller, but all bear some weight. Everybody knows they've got the backpack on. We get here and on the Lord's Day, and part of what we do is we have little hooks there in the lobby, and we take off our backpack. we got whatever, a couple of hundred hooks or whatever, and we, everybody puts their backpack up on the hooks like we're in school, right? Like we're in, um, and we lay them all out there, and at the end of it, what you generally do is that you pick up your own backpack and you strap it back on your, you make sure that's your name, and Jim S., and that's mine, and so I, I pick it up and I strap it on. All right, here's what the text is saying. Go out there in the lobby, find somebody else's, and carry theirs for a while. Go out there and find a burden not your own. Find a weight not your own. Consider what's weighing another person down. Find it, pick it up, and carry it. Now, if we do that, if we determine that we are going to carry the weight and the burden of another, we are doing it with the hope that they are going to be relieved of the burden that they carry. What has been weighing them down this past week is something that you're saying that you are going to carry for them. That's the idea that Paul is getting across. That the weight that felt upon their shoulders... In the coming week, whatever we're going to feel is not a weight of my own design and my own making, but it is a weight that you've been bearing. Now, what difference might it make in my week if I bear your burden and you bear mine? If you take and you are concerned with not your own situation, but the situations of others. I'm going to give you a word of warning before I go any further. If you want to obey this text, it's going to be painful. If you want to shield yourself from the pain of this text, then continue to isolate yourself in the body. Don't talk to anybody. 
particularly anybody who seems troubled. Don't call anybody. Don't email anybody. Don't invite anybody. Don't have fellowship with anybody. Please don't get to know anybody because if you do that, and you really begin to take their cares and their concerns upon your soul, you know what? Sometimes the troubles of others will keep you awake. And it's got nothing to do with you other than your heart and your love for them. That's it. It's not your responsibility. Not, well, it is in a sense yours. But only by affection. Only by love and only by biblical constraint. What if I picked up your backpack instead of my own? And I determined that I was going to carry it and view its weight in place of my own. What difference would it make? The knowledge that I'm carrying someone else is burden that they are carrying my burden may, may make my light, my week lighter, but it may make it a lot harder. In either case, it would take my mind away from my own burdens, which I normally carry, and it would make me thoughtful, concerned, and informed about the life of my brother. What are you really going through? What are you really bearing? What's really, what, what's really going on in your life? Well, carry their backpack for a week, and you'll have some idea. Now, I want to make a couple of points about this. The first thing I want to say, and for a little general illustration there, we must know their burdens. If you're going to carry their burdens, you must not only know that they have them, I think you need to know something of what they are. One of my favorite texts is 1 Peter 5, 7. Some of you know it by heart. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. In that text, we acknowledge that we have burdens or cares or concerns or anxieties. And in that text, it's a text I've preached on several times here, and I'll preach on it again, I'm sure. Um, and I'll probably use a lot of the same illustrations and everything else because it's just it's a great text that we need to look at. And what that tells us is that when you feel burdens, you're to bring them to God. And you're to cast them on God over and over again. As often as you are aware of your burden, you are to unburden yourself, place your burden on the shoulders of your great God with the knowledge that He cares for you. So there's a little play on words. You have things that are cares, cast them on God because He cares for you, used in a different way. You have anxieties, cast them upon the heart of the God who has affection for you. Our text is telling us that we are not only to bring our burdens to God with the knowledge of His love, but that we are to be open with our brethren with the knowledge that God's people are expressions of His love for us. I brought this to God, but let me tell you about what's been weighing me down. And He loves me. And part of the way that He expresses His love is that He puts me in a body of people who are concerned for me, and who will pray for me and who will do whatever they can to help lighten my load and bear part of my weight on their shoulders because they love me. I'll use another backpack illustration. Sometimes you're going on a hike and you may have three people and there are three people with three backpacks. And one of the guys, for whatever reason, has decided he's going to pack a whole lot heavier than what the other two pack. So you've got one guy, and he's got a, a stove and a, you know, an oven back there, and his catcher's mitt and five baseballs and a baseball bat, and he's got a two-gallon thing of lemonade back there, and the other guy brought a sandwich and a Twinkie. And, and what you say is, listen, the guy can't leave any of it back, and you say, well, hey, let's distribute it. Let's distribute the weight. So you've got less on you. We'll, we'll take more on us, but we love you enough. We'll take some of your weight on us. And then all of us will bear an equal weight. Right? That's part of what is going on. When we allow others to know our burdens, we are saying to them, listen, I know that not only God cares for me and loves me, but that his people do too, or at least that ought to be our assumption. <laughs> and we must know if we're going to bear, bear burdens, we must know who has them. We need to know what they are. If we are to help them. Now, uh, sometimes in order to know that somebody is troubled, you only have to open your eyes. Sometimes uh, people hide their burdens. They hide their weights well. And they don't let you know that they're struggling. 
Well, let me share something from a personal perspective, and I, and I want to thank you all uh, in this. A few weeks ago, I acknowledged to a number of you that I was feeling somewhat frayed at the edges, okay? I was tired, and I was discouraged. Uh, you want to know why I didn't preach a couple of weeks ago? It's because I told some of the elders that. And they said, you're taking a Sunday off. That's why I was here, and that's why Pastor Bob preached, and Pastor John preached, and Charlie preached. And you know what that did for each of them? It added trouble to each of them. It added weight to their week because they took my burden, a burden I carry virtually every week for you, they took. Okay? That's why they did it. But, not just what they did, but some of you others, when I told you that, uh, because I wasn't going to hide it, and if somebody were to ask, well, how are you doing? I'd say, well, to be honest with you, I'm feeling a little frayed at the edges, I'm kind of tired, and I've been somewhat discouraged of late. Now, I could have put on a mask, and I could have said everything's fine, and from some perspective, I could tell you everything is fine, compared to what others were going through, compared to what Cheryl and Chris and Joseph's grandparents are going through. Life is great. I'll tell you something else. I shared my burden with some of my pastor friends that I meet with for breakfast. And in light of what they've gone through and their churches, they were kind of laughing at me. And I had to realize, all right, I realize it's not that big. Okay, in light of, it's not, it's not what they're going through. But it was mine. And, it, and, it, and I felt it. The point that I want to make is, is that in exposing weakness and allowing others to know I had a burden, it caused others to carry that burden. Some of you carried my burden, I am well convinced, in prayer. In fact, you carried that burden so well that, I'm going to tell you guys now, after the fact, that by the time that Sunday came, I felt I could have preached. <laughs> but I'm thankful. I'm thankful that, at least in prayer, God's people became aware of that burden and they took that burden before God. And it was helpful. By acknowledging weakness, God's people prayed, the pressure began to lift. And I bless God for that. Now, if others are to obey this text in regard to you, if they are to be an aid to you and be for you what they ought to be, it's going to require you to be transparent to that degree. And if you are to bear the burdens of others, you must get close enough to your brothers and sisters and love them well enough and be faithful enough to them that they can be vulnerable with you and transparent with you without the thought that you're going to turn away from them, reject them, blow them all. I don't want to be around them anymore. Old gloomy Gus, all those burdens anymore. Yeesh. I'm going to have him over. Mr. Burden. Right? Well, you, 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 oh, you know the problem. All right, so you must know. You must know about the burdens of others. And again, that requires some to make their burdens known. It requires you to be observant and listening and picking up on those burdens. Now, you must not only know those burdens. The text says you must bear the burdens. The word bear means to take up in your own hands. We have here what is called a present active imperative, which means two things. It means it's a duty, it's imperative, and it means it's a regular duty. If you love people, you will do this. This is really what I'm going to get to at the end. I'm going to go and give a little preview. And if you don't love people, you won't do this. But to the degree that you truly love people, you will strive to do this. When I was in Zambia, and those of you who have been there have seen it, maybe you've seen it in other countries. Do you have anybody that wanted to carry your burdens for you? Every time Megan goes to the grocery store, there are a group of people competing to carry her burdens. Now, why are they doing that? Usually kids, what we call street urchins. 
They come out there and they sometimes want to quite literally wrench her burden. Now, see how she has to like guard her burdens. She's got to come out of the store and you know grab all, because somebody's going to grab them and then expect payment for carrying her groceries three feet from you know uh, the door to the car. You know, give me money for what I just did. They are not concerned for her. They're not doing what they do out of love. They're doing it again, hopefully, to gain pennies. Now, the gaining of pennies is incentive enough for them to be watchful of people that have burdens. It enriches them. All right. We have a far greater incentive to look out and to consider those who have troubles. The ones who are burdened are our friends. They are our family. And unlike those boys in Zambia, we are not seeking to enrich ourselves, at least materially, by our carrying their burdens, but we are striving to lighten their loads, to be an aid to them. Now, physically, we often, let me just say this, sometimes, say a word maybe to our young men here in particular. You ought to have eagle eyes for people that are physically burdened so that when you're standing outside and you're talking and you see a lady coming in and she's carrying in a crock pot and a diaper bag and has one of her kids balanced on her head or something like that, at least open the door. But you ought to be running out there to say, hey, there's need, there's need. I can meet that need. I can let me carry that for you. Because that's what love does. That's kindness, mannerliness. But here is something far greater. Now, I mentioned that the word here, bear, is an imperative, which means it's a duty again. But it's in the present tense, meaning that it is a regular, ongoing duty. Part of that means that there will always be burdens to carry, and that some of these burdens you will always carry. There will always be burdens to carry, and some of your brethren are always going to have burdens. Some of these burdens aren't going to leave them in this life. And so as long as you love them, as long as you're committed to them, your relationship with means... You're going to be burdened. You're going to have burdens. You're going to have weight on you because you're taking weight off them that you wouldn't have if you didn't love them. And that's, that's your life. And you need, you need to joyfully reckon with that. For the rest of my life or for the rest of their life, I will carry this because I love them, because I am committed to them. This is going to mean, again, getting close to people, loving people, adding weight to your life. It will mean a degree of emotional hardship at times that you do not presently have. Let me suggest some practical ways in which we can work this out. I say practical. The first one's emotionally. Some burdens people have are emotional burdens. And in entering into their emotional life, doing things like rejoicing with those who rejoice and Weeping with those who weep, you are entering in to the emotional life of your brothers and sisters. And a lot of burdens that people carry are these emotional burdens. Paul can suppose that even in a fractured, divided church like Corinth, that he could make the following statement, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Is that true? Is it, is it really true? No. It's, it, it, uh, have we lived that out? Have you suffered with the sufferings of others? Have you felt their weight? Have you wept when people have wept? Rejoiced when they have rejoiced? That's the assumption Paul can make. Because there's an entering into their life, feeling something of what they're feeling, striving to be. Now, I'm not saying we can do that fully. But to some degree that we recognize and realize, here's somebody that I love and not all is well with them. And what can I do to hear you out, to know what you're going through, what you're experiencing? Is there any way I can be a help to any way I can? And sometimes it's just being there to hear them 
and to allow them to unburden themselves. You say sometimes after talking to somebody, I had no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea you were going through that. I had no idea this weighed you down. And sometimes just being able to discuss those things on their end, verbally. I'm going to talk about verbally from our end in just a moment. Spiritually, we can bear one another's burdens. And by this, I am referring primarily to prayer. We can take one another before the throne of grace. We can pray. And we can ask God to do things in somebody's life and add our prayers to their prayers. And others can add their prayers so that that great burden that they've been taking before God alone in prayer is now divided among many who take that burden before God verbally. Now, I began this week working, anticipating I was going to preach on the text, comfort one another with these words. And I was going to talk about that, all the context of that in which that's used. And then later, Paul talks about comforting and edifying one another by speaking. There are words that we can use, Bible words, biblical truths that we can use that can lighten the load of others. Many of you are aware, and Pastor Bob made reference, and I think maybe this morning made reference, actually it was this morning, I believe, that the Williamsons have hit a bit of a rough patch. Now, that required some vulnerability on the part of our, and I, I say this, I don't really say this tongue in cheek, our missionary heroes. Right? The Williamsons. They went to Zambia. And you know what? And they're struggling. It's hard. And when Megan unloaded some of those burdens and let you in and gave you a glimpse into her heart, did you pray more earnestly? Yeah. Because she made a burden. Oh, there's a burden. We've got to go carry that. What can we do? And, and we went to do what we could to help with that. And your words... I spoke with them yesterday, day before Friday, I can't remember. Your words conveyed in emails, your blog comments, and even good old letters sent in the old-fashioned mail have meant a lot to them. And if you have the time and the resources and the know-how and your relationship to such, I'd encourage you to give them a call. I don't want to, I don't I realize this could sound arrogant and I don't mean it to. I'm just trying to give an encouragement with this. I'm going to use a personal example. Hey, I have it in my notes. It was Friday. That's when I talked to them. Good old notes. I phoned James and Megan on Friday. And he said to me, this was very humbling, but he said, I knew you'd call. I knew you loved me. And I knew you were going to call. Verbally. Just hearing my voice. Put Megan on the phone. Talk to Megan. Now, what did you do? I didn't go to Zambia. I didn't change anything. I didn't fix any people over there. But were they encouraged? Were they helped? Was their burden lightened? I love the words of First Samuel 23. David's in this incredibly difficult situation with his father-in-law. And we read in verse 15, So David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. Well, that's a kind of a burden, I would think. How are you doing? Somebody's trying to kill me. Oh, really? And you're not just paranoid? No, somebody's really... Oh, and he's the king. Bit of a trouble. So David was in the wilderness... Of Ziph in a forest. Now, where had he been living before that? He lived in a house, a nice house. He was the chief warrior of Israel, he was a big man. Where's he living now? Out in the forest. Everybody loves camping, right? That's not why David's there. Imagine David was burdened. Did David ever feel anything heavily? David, David was never open about his emotions. David was never down. David was always just, right, steady as a rock. 
Now, that's not David, is it? But what did God do? What, did, what, was, it, what was the means God used? Then Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods. He couldn't text him. He got up and he went. He went to David in the woods and he strengthened his hand in God. And he said to him, and he said to him, Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. You shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you. Even my father Saul knows that. Now, what's he actually saying there? He's saying, remember what God said. That's what he's saying to him. David, remember what God said? And it put steel in David's backbone. It lightened his burden. Physically. Physically. There are ways that we can bear other people's burdens physically. Think, for instance, of the psalm. And again, what I'm going to say here is difficult. You're going to have to work through this. Some of you pray through it. If God is convicting you, showing you something you could or should do. Some people's problem right now is monetary. And their burden, what is weighing them down, is monetary. It may be somebody could do something to take at least part of that burden away monetarily. James 2 says, at verse 15, If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, Depart in peace, be warmed and filled, and you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? You want to be spiritual? Put some food on their table. Put some clothes on their back. The words of John are equally strong, 1 John 3:17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from the kin, how does the love of God abide in him? You may be able to aid another in bearing their burdens by some kind of physical labor. You ever thought to yourself, you know, so-and-so maybe could use a meal. And then go any further than that? And do you know what's happened when you've actually gone a little further than that? And on Sunday you've said, hey, I've got something in the refrigerator for you. Or you come and you knock on the door. I heard your kids were sick. Can I, get you, can I do your laundry? Can I come over and make dinner for everybody? Can I watch the kids so the two of you can get out? I know it's been a long, hard stretch. You all need some time. Hey, some of us got together and we got your room at whatever, Holiday Inn Express. And here's a gift card for Chili's. Have a good night. We're going to stay here and we're going to watch the kids and the dogs and let you have a night. There are physical things that we can do. Aiding and cleaning a yard. Car repair drive to the doctor, whatever the case may be, can be a great burden. Sometimes simply your presence, being there. I'm going to make my little promise again about Job. I plan to preach Job. I plan right now to be my next series when I'm done with this, which means maybe April or May we'll be in Job. God willing, maybe. When Job was suffering, he had three friends that came. And I think we're to take a, 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 a vote. Who are the three biggest jerks in the Bible? <laughs> Not evil men, but you just want to say, like, hey, the, the most unhelpful friends in all the world are the three friends that Job had. Have you ever wondered why Job didn't say, get out of my house or punch them in the nose? Do you think, now let me ask, do you think those men loved Job? They, I mean, they actually, I believe they did. They were very, very bad at expressing it. But you know what happened when Job's children died and Job was afflicted? They left where they were and they went and they sat with him for days and they just cried with him. And I want to tell you something. You want to build up some goodwill that will take a long time to exhaust? Be that kind of friend. I think that's why Job bore with them as long as he did. Years ago when I was bereaved, and I've told this before, when we lost our son, 
And I don't know how he heard, but my college roommate in Mississippi heard. And he got in his car and he drove up to have lunch with me and to hug me and pray with me. And he got in his car and he drove back. And Becky's prayer partner flew from Georgia because a phone call wasn't enough. Or an email wasn't enough. They wanted to be there. And sometimes, simply so that we can share the burden of another, to let them know that we love them and that we want to be there for them, we're going to show up. They're going to know. And they ought to know. We're going to do what we can to be there. Let me give a little um, formula here in this regard. And this is something I wrote years ago, but I think it's a good, valid thing to say. When our brothers and sisters are in need, I'm just going to say, let you unpack it. We ought to have swift feet, open ears, long arms, busy hands, and small mouths. Let's consider thirdly and finally tonight the glorious truth fulfilled. What if there were a church that bore each other's burdens? What if there were a church where one member suffered that was felt throughout the whole body? What about a church where if one member rejoiced, it just swept through the body? What about a church where the burdens among the body are distributed by the body. And people know that if I've got a burden and I make that burden know, I know somehow, whether by their presence, by their encouragements, by their gifts, by their prayers, they're going to shoulder this burden with me. Do you know what a church like that does? They fulfill the law of Christ. Let me do the reverse for just a minute just to have this weigh on us what are the consequences if we don't bear one another's burdens I'll tell you what's going to happen people in this church not that this has ever happened of course feel unloved unwanted or not part of the body you caught my sarcasm this coming to this now I want, to make a, I want to make a distinction between what we do on the Lord's Day and what we are all the days of the week. When you come here on the Lord's Day, your preeminent desire, need, duty is to give, the, give to God the glory to His name. It's to come, it's to worship God. You come as living stones. And the purpose of that stone is to form a spiritual, all, to form a spiritual temple in which God is there in the midst. And we're here for God. Right? We're here to hear the Word of God. We're here to sing the praises of God. We're here to pray to God. We're here to be reminded of eternal realities. We're here for those great spiritual truths. But what makes this not a conference? Not a Bible conference that you just drive to and then drive away from. What makes this more than a spiritual theatrical experience where you might run into friends? We're a body and we are a family, which means it is more than preaching and more than worship and more than regulated worship. It's more than doctrine. To be a church means relation. It means one anothering. And a faithful church isn't simply known by its faithful pulpit ministry and faithful doctrine and faithful worship. Because if we have faithful preaching and faithful worship and all of the rest, and yet we don't love one another, then we're nothing. We're not fulfilling the law of Christ. We're not. And if we don't bear burdens, and people have burdens, and they're never carried by others, and people feel unloved, unwanted, not part of the body, and again, some of that may be their fault. But we ought to live in such a way, and love in such a way, that we can say to somebody who says that, now, you can't say that about me. 
I'm not tooting my own horn, but you can't say I don't love you. And you can't say my family doesn't love you, and you can't say they don't love you, you can't say because they've borne your burdens, and they've prayed for you, and they've loved you, and they've wept for you, and they've met your needs. There are some who do feel that their experience of church life is only corporate. And that's important. Very important. But that's not why God puts people into churches. There are in our day other things that we could do to get preaching. Good preaching. And better preaching than you get here. Okay? You want to know? Well, that's going to be my opinion. I'll give you some links to the internet. And if you want to sing with other people, there are places you can do that, too. And sing hymns. You can do that, too. But the church is uniquely the body of Christ and the family of God in a way that a Christian concert isn't and a preaching conference isn't. This is where the dynamics of our family life take place. It's an important issue to think through in regard uh, to what the Apostle here brings out. And that is, what's really special and powerful in this text is that you actually can fulfill the law of Christ. You can, you can, we can. Isn't that wonderful? Paul doesn't hedge it and say, now, we all know you can't really do this and You know, and yes, I guess there's some... No, he says you do. When you do this, when you love people enough to carry their burdens, you are fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, what's the law of Christ? Well, you know what it is. 1 John 4, 21 says, And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. 1 John 5, 2 and 3. By this we know that we, are, that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His, commandment, His commandments are not burdensome. In the context, that commandment is the commandment to love one another. Excuse me, John, uh, James 2 and verse 8. If you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. Romans 13.10, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. Love is the mark of the believer. And love has, as we have striven to show tonight, practical dimensions as well as affectionate manifestations. If we are a flock in which the only verse is fulfilled, is that, as verse 5, that we all bear our own burdens. Let's have a church like that. Let's have a church where everybody carries his own load. Right? And so I, I'm fulfilling Galatians 6. If that is our church and we have no desire, no attempt, no practical outworking of this truth, then brethren, we are in trouble. We're in trouble. The law of Christ is not being fulfilled. And that's huge. And it's also huge when it is. You want to be an obedient disciple, don't you? You want to obey the commands of God, don't you? Don't you? You don't want to be at war with one of God's commands. You want to look at God's commands and say, I'm not going to do that. It is fulfilled when you love one another. God's law is fulfilled. It's kept. That's what the Bible says. I I, I understand all the other things the Bible says about that. But it does say that when we care for one another, when we bear one another's burdens, this little place can be a place. And it has been among some, and I pray it will be across the board. That we want to say, you want to see where the law of Jesus Christ is fulfilled? And not just say, you want to hear some good preaching and some old-fashioned, regular life worship. You want to be at a place that has real prayer meetings. You want to be at a place that practices church discipline. You want to be at a place that has historic, confessional Christianity. That's us. 
I also want, I want to be in a place, I do, I like a place like that. But I want to be in a place that fulfills the law of Christ. And you have a part in that. That is beyond this pulpit. That's beyond what we put on the internet. That's, that, that has to be experienced in the lives of God's people. People of God fulfill the law of Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we do pray that we will fulfill the law of Jesus. And we ask in His name. Amen.